Um, yeah, so let's go where we finished last time. I added some references to the notes uh, because uh, as you have seen today in uh, Stefan's lecture, uh, these locally convex topologies uh, might be of interest. So here is a bunch of references uh, for the start to uh, kind of, if you want to familiarize yourself with uh, various locally convex topologies that are um, relevant in this setting, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. So I will leave all the fun to, to Stefan. Uh, so where we finished uh, yesterday was to define a one form uh, on the configuration space that I call GL, which gives me the equations of motion as um, this condition. And uh, then I said that I'm interested in the space of solutions and I'm interested in it in a sort of functional way. So I really want to um, find the space of functionals on the space of solutions. And I want to see it as uh, this portion. So uh, let me bring it to the next lecture. So I'm going to uh, find uh, a derived version of that quotient. And just to recall the notation, so uh, this was the space of multi-local functionals. So not all the wild crazy functionals, but the ones that are sums of products of local ones. So multi-local functionals. Okay, and for this quotient, uh, I will first make an observation. So we have a one form, the L. Now one forms pair nicely with vector fields. So take a vector field, X, and I assume that this vector field is also multi-local. So, uh, which is also multi-local as a map, okay? And now if I pair my one form with that vector field, well, this is obviously a functional. And uh, well, from the fact that the space of solutions is defined as the zero locus of DL, well, this vanishes on the space of solutions. So by definition. So I recall you that F0 is functionals that vanish on the space of solutions. And now uh, I give you an example of such a functional. Okay, and now here is a non-trivial assumption. So we assume that all the elements of um, F0 arise this way. So they can be written as some vector field uh, contracted with the one form of equations of motion. So, so this is now an assumption. So, assume that all elements of F0 arise this way. And, and this is not a trivial assumption. So uh, it, it <laughs> obviously requires checking uh, before you start. Uh, doing something with it. Uh, fortunately, it's actually uh, fulfilled in uh, all uh, well theories of physical interests. Um, and this is, well, I mean, there are two ingredients for, for showing that this assumption is fulfilled. So uh, one of them is that we are working with local things. So locality is important. And uh, second of all, well, uh, it's, uh, kind of obvious if you don't have symmetries, um, it's less obvious if you do, but then uh, you're typically working with theories where uh, the redundancy can be removed 
uh, after gauge fixing. So the class of theories we are working with in physics is, is the nice class of theories where this assumption is fulfilled. So for, for the proof, for the detailed argument, um, I refer you to uh, the works of Eno and collaborators. I will give you uh, more detailed references later. So, so Mark Eno uh, and others. So this is proof of that assumption fulfilled in physical, in, well, in examples of physical interests, in examples of physical interests. Okay, so we dealt with that. Uh, and I'm going to need some notation. Uh, oh, there is a question. Uh, okay, well, I don't know what that is. Uh, oh, um, uh, sure. Uh, so, okay, so, 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 uh, well, he, here, uh, just to, make well so, so first of all uh i think it's obvious that uh, to uh, describe functionals on the space of solutions we take the quotient of um all the functionals by those that vanish on the space of solutions uh and then uh we run a risk that we might not quotient out all the functionals that vanish on solutions if we just quotient by functionals that arise from contraction with vector fields. So this assumption is to make sure that we are uh, quotienting enough. Uh, so uh, if I, well, let me introduce this notation uh, on the flight. So uh, I'm going to denote V log, the space of local vector fields local vector uh, denote local vector fields. Okay, and then V multi-local and then V reg regular. So this corresponds to, to these boring functions that, that uh, Stefan uh, mentioned at the end uh, that are not singular enough for most uh, applications, but are convenient to work with. Okay, so uh, what we know is that uh, insertion of the L um, acting on V, is contained in F0. So this is obvious by definition. And by assumption, we actually have the equality. Okay, so that's, the reason for doing this. Um, and yeah, I will give you the reference for uh, the proof of this assumption being fulfilled in interesting examples. Okay, um, right. So now, of course, you can also completely ignore it and just work with this quotient, whatever it is, okay? Whether it describes your functionals on shell or not, ignore it just just work with it because, because this is what uh, is the right algebraic thing to do and, and to worry about any sort of uh, physical interpretation of that fact. So we can just run away with that portion. Uh, okay, so uh, I have the space of vector fields. So uh, I can, uh, let me uh, denote this map, um, this insertion of uh, the L let me denote this by delta. So 
this now defines a map from vector fields to functionals. So I have uh, V delta F, and here I can extend by zero. And now from this, I can build my differential graded algebra by um, extending this map delta to um, multi-vector fields using the graded Leibniz rule. So here uh, I extend, extend delta to all multi-vector fields, multi, well, that's a bit silly, but multi-local multi-vector fields uh, by using the graded Leibniz rule. So if I do it uh, this way, so I can now have uh, higher orders. And uh, let me now assign degrees maybe in a slightly uh, outrageous way. So this is going to be degree zero. This is minus one. This is minus two. So this is going to be uh, graded in negative degree. This is uh, just a convention to be consistent with uh, the physics literature. There's nothing uh, deep about it. Some people use the opposite convention. Okay, and by construction, uh, by the way we extended this delta to multi-vector fields, uh, this uh, delta is squares to zero. So we have a differential graded algebra. So uh, the, uh, the product is obviously the, the, the wedge product. Differential graded algebra. And uh, let's look at, uh, well, the first two or the last two um, cohomological uh, degrees. So let's compute the zero uh, cohomology and minus one cohomology. So first compute zero, compute H zero. And this is very nice because, so we have the kernel of this map here, which happens to be all of F because everything is mapped to zero through the image of Sorry? delta here. So just, we have, yes? Just a question, these yes. products, um, so V is V an F module, could, could you say? Uh, yes, that's correct. And so the, the, the exterior products is, um, is uh, over the, the, the ring F in some sense. Um, yes, that's correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. So you, you think of it as a, a direct analogy of uh, vector fields on the manifold and functions on the manifold. So yeah, that's uh, the, the, well, yeah. So the only, the only change here is that because we are in infinite dimensions, I have to impose some additional restriction on the kinds of vector fields and functions I'm taking. But otherwise, think functions on the manifold, uh, vector fields on the manifold, and uh, this would be just the standard uh, wedge product for, uh, for vector fields. Does it make sense? Yes. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, good, so uh, yeah, so H zero here is F, so that's the kernel quotient by the image, so delta of V and by assumption, uh, so this is assumption, this is F quotient by F zero, which is the on shell functionals, so functionals on the solution space. So this is what we wanted to get out of that story. Functionals on the solution space. Okay, but, but we have now this, this, this nice differential graded algebra. It has 
more degrees than uh, the, the zero one. So, so what sits in those degrees? Um, so let's now compute H minus one. And here, first of all, let's look at the kernel. So we are looking now at the kernel of this map. So we are looking at uh, the kernel of delta consists of vector fields such that, so now delta of uh, x is defined as the insertion of the L to the x. Um, so the contraction of one form with this, this vector field. So this has to be identically zero. So it's a zero functional everywhere. Okay, so not just on the solution space, everywhere. Um, and this tells us about something about um, the Lagrangian itself. So what does it mean? What am I doing here? So geometrically, uh, I can think of it, and, and this is now maybe a bit uh, vague, but bear with me. So this is the same as taking uh, the derivation uh, induced by X, applying it to L of F. So remember there was this cutoff for F equals to one on support X. So I'm looking at, uh, well, the infinitesimal change of the Lagrangian applying under applying that vector field. So uh, this should remind you uh, of something. So in classical uh, mechanics, when we have symmetries, then these symmetries correspond to directions in which um, the uh, Lagrangian, the action is constant. So, uh, and this is exactly what happens here. So X uh, describes us a direction in which the Lagrangian is constant. So it's a symmetry, okay? So X is a symmetry. So H1 or H minus one, sorry, H minus one uh, tells us something about the symmetries of the theory. Uh, but now let's look at what's in the image. So I'm, I'm back to um, my differential complex. So what's in the image of Delta? And uh, I think it works nicely if uh, I write it uh, explicitly. So image of Delta, oops, that's a Delta. So let's take uh, X wedge Y in uh, degree two, and now compute uh, Delta on that. So Delta of X wedge Y. So there is Delta on X. So that's going to be uh, the L insertion of X times Y. So this is now just the ordinary product because we have um, the, module multiplication here of a functional and a vector field. And now minus, because of the graded Leibniz rule, uh, the same dl y, and now ordinary product with x. OK, so this is obviously a symmetry, right? If you apply uh, delta again, then these two terms cancel. Um, so that's a symmetry. But it's a very trivial symmetry, because this symmetry vanishes on the space of solutions, right? Because each of these terms will vanish on when evaluated on a solution. So such symmetry, such symmetry vanishes on the solution space ES. Hence, it's called trivial. Okay. So, so these these guys get quotiented out of uh, h minus one. So we want to ignore them somehow. So, hence, uh, from our discussion, h minus one.
local. So we are working with uh, local or multi-local things, symmetries. Okay, so, so this is an important bit of information. Um, so we can use H minus one to recognize whether our theory uh, has symmetries or not. So now examples. So scalar field. Has no um, non trivial. Local symmetries in this sense. And uh, well, Young Mills theories say do have symmetries as a well. ball. Okay, uh, so, so there will be different ways of uh, dealing with uh, these situations. Uh, are there any questions up to now? That's uh, the real scalar field, right? That's the real one. Yes, I should add this. Yes. Yeah, so, so the, the complex scalar field has, uh, has, has a symmetry. So it's, it's a bit more complex, yes. Uh, so yeah, that's a, thanks for that. And also one question, you had this assumption which guaranteed that in H0, you yes. get only uh, non-trivial functionals on shell. Yes. Here, um, that seems to be only a subspace of the trivial symmetries that you are quotienting out. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. So, uh, yeah, so the argument you're using for uh, H0 actually also carries over for H uh, minus one. So, so that's true. Uh, that it's it's not uh, it's not entirely obvious, um, but uh, the the argument carries over. Okay, thanks. So and and uh, so I'm sorry, I'm I'm not going into details with that, but this this requires introducing uh, jet bundles and and doing things with indices. So I I want to spare myself that, uh, but. Uh, yeah, so I will give you the detailed reference in, in the notes. Okay, uh, so let me continue. Uh, now, there is a nice way of um, finding something uh, with no non-trivial local symmetries. Uh, so there is, there is a sufficient condition, in fact, uh, that guarantees that uh, there are no non-trivial local symmetries. And uh, because it nicely segues into uh, hyperbolic equations, I, I want to state this condition here. So sufficient condition for H minus one to be trivial okay so this sufficient uh so let me introduce some notation so let me denote uh p phi denotes the differential operator that is induced by the second derivative so we looked at the first derivative as the equations of, sorry, second derivative of, of the Lagrangian. So we looked at the first derivative of the Lagrangian as equations of motion. Now the second derivative of the Lagrangian is linearized equations of motion. So denotes uh, the differential operator induced, induced by the second derivative. So this you can, think of as linearized equations of motion. Uh, 
Um, and this sufficient condition is that this operator is normally hyperbolic. So uh, this sufficient condition, uh, maybe I should uh, write it in a slightly different configuration. It's, it's the best thing about uh, doing things on the tablet is you can actually move things around. Um, so P phi is normally hyperbolic. And then, so, so, right, so normally hyperbolic, it means that it's principal symbol, so it's its highest uh, order uh, part of, of the symbol. Um, well, the bit with the highest derivative uh, is uh, that of, of the wave operator. So it's essentially wave operator and friends, so Dalen version and friends. Um, so this is, for example, Dalen version. And what we know about Dell inversion and what we know about normally hyperbolic operators is that they don't have non-trivial compactly supported solutions. And, and this is the fact which uh, is used in showing that for such systems, there are no non-trivial local symmetries. And again, uh, for the proof, I will send you to my paper with Klaus Frenhagen on classical BV. So proof, oops. Proof. Uh, so that would be Frenhagen. Classical. So I will give you exact reference later. Classical BB and so on. Okay. So uh, now I want to talk a bit more about those operators and. Uh, Maybe that's also going to be useful for Stefan because he announced to be dealing with those guys. So uh, I want to spend some time uh, talking about it. Uh, so well, hyperbolic differential equations. So first of all, okay, with the conventions, Ooh, uh, my internet is unstable. Can you hear me? I missed one sentence. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I will give you the reference to the proof and now I'm going to talk about uh, normally hyperbolic operators. So let's take P phi. P phi, which is in my convention a map from E to compactly supported sections of E dual subset E prime, uh, normally hyperbolic. So for such guys, we know the existence of uh, some distinguished green functions. So there exist uh, unique, so exist unique, retarded and advanced, silly names, advanced green functions, delta R phi delta A phi. Phi is because uh, you see, I linearized at a point. So, so this, this can, uh, well, obviously, all depend on the point. Uh, so these are now functions. Whoops, come on here. These are now functions uh, going in the opposite direction. So from compactly supported sections of the dual bundle back to E such that, well, they are green functions. So guess what? So delta R A phi composed with the operator, I have to restrict to compactly supported. And <clears throat> because this is a differential operator has also image, 
in compactly supported things. It's a local operator. Um, so, so then this is well defined because these green functions are only defined on, uh, well, something slightly larger than compactly supported, but compactly supported is good. Um, so this have, has to be an identity on compactly supported sections and the other, right, uh, the other way around. So P phi composed with that guy is also an identity on compactly supported sections of the dual. So that's being green functions. And now about being retarded and advanced, well, here we go. So I have a test function, which is compactly supported. And now the retarded green function has a support to the future of F and the advanced green function has a support to the past of F. So these are the support properties. And these make them unique. Okay, so I take those guys and uh, I take the difference thereof. So define, um, should maybe, how do I close this? Ah, like this. So define something I call delta phi. Sorry, I should also have phi here, phi here. Uh, so this is defined as the difference between the retarded and advanced green function. So this is again a map from EC to E, so compactly supported sections of the dual to all smooth sections. And this is called a pauli oden function. or for reasons that will become obvious very soon, commutator function. And this guy I'm going to use to uh, define a Poisson structure. So, so this will connect to what uh, Stefan was uh, talking about. So, Okay, how do I do that? Well, first of all, um, I can use uh, some magic. So for example, using Schwarzkörner uh, theorem, I can um, find uh, an integral kernel that corresponds to that operator. So I want to extract an integral kernel out of that business. So this induces an integral kernel And uh, well, for obvious reasons, I'm going to call it pi phi, which is now uh, a distributional section of here, the dual tensor two over the second power of m. So this is an integral kernel. Um, and I use the notation pi because uh, I want to, to, to see it as a generalized Poisson by vector. Yes, there is a question. Uh, uh, no, uh, phi is a point in the space of all configurations. So, so I'm, I'm working off shell. I'm not working on the space of solutions at the moment. So, so here phi, phi is actually general. Um, because uh, in, in this, uh, well, sort of derived way of doing things, um, I want to construct my structures um, on, on the co-chain level. So no restrictions to the space of solutions. And then I will uh, go on shell. So I will restrict to the space of solutions uh, by taking uh, cohomology at the end. So I want to build my structures on the coaching level, hence uh, all the functionals and hence all configurations, not um, 
uh, not restricting to uh, to the solutions. But yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, very good. So now this association phi maps to pi phi is a generalized Poisson. Well, let's say first generalized by vector. So it would be a by vector if this was a compactly supported section uh, of uh, of uh, the second tensor power of E, um, but it's not, it's a distributional section, so uh, hence generalized. But this is where some of these subtleties of uh, working in infinite dimensions are coming in. Uh, now, I said Poisson already, uh, and I mean it. So you can check that uh, this is indeed a Poisson uh, by vector so that it is anti-symmetric. This, is, this follows from the uniqueness of the retarded and advanced green functions. Uh, the Jacobi identity is actually more tricky to uh, show. So this is in fact, in fact, a Poisson. Poisson generalized by vector. And uh, well, non-trivial, non-trivial thing to show. is the Jacobi identity. And for that, uh, it's a bit embarrassing, but the best reference is um, a diploma thesis from Hamburg um, of a guy named uh, Jacobs, funnily enough, and it's available in German. I hope that most of you speak German, so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, all my PhD students now at least speak a bit of German because I always send them to these diploma thesis from Hamburg. Um, so it's called Eichbrücken uh, in the Klassischen I think I did the wrong number of S's. Uh, Klassischen uh, Feld theory. So, so it's it's actually a computation, but it's a bit messy. Um, and apart from uh, the fact that you have to like do some non-trivial combinatorics, it follows from the fact that the third derivative of uh, L of the Lagrangian is symmetric. So you use that and uh, some combinatorics manipulating derivatives of these retarded and advanced green functions. Then you use the fact that these are uh, each other's transposes and that should come out. So you use, use that delta R transposed is delta A and that the third derivative of the action is symmetric. Sorry, the Lagrangian. Okay, and, and you can have a look. This is available on the AQFT Hamburg uh, website. Okay, so we have a Poisson structure. And I can now define a Poisson bracket. So use this to define. Uh huh. Um, ooh, um, hmm. no, yes, yes, to some extent. Um, so uh, you have to have those uh, retarded and advanced green functions. You have to have some sort of 
causality. So, so there is a paper uh, I, I wrote with um, Chris Fuster, uh, Edmund Doubleheave, and, and Nick Woods, um, where we look at something called causal sets. So, so these are finite uh, sets of points with um, partial order that simulates causality relations. So uh, there you have a finite dimensional system with this notion of causality. And there you can also um, construct uh, something like a retarded green function, advanced green function, and you can uh, build all these structures. So that is the finite dimensional analog of, of this story. So uh, I can put that paper in the references as well. So this is uh, me, Chris Fuster, uh, Edmund Doubleheave, and Nick Woods. Um, and it's called, um, I think, perturbative algebraic quantum field theory on causal sets or something like that. Um, so, so then you can look at all these things with a bit less um, functional analysis uh, baggage. Can we take M to be zero dimensional or something? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, well, it's not enough because you need some sort of uh, causality. I mean, you can, but that's a bit trivial. Uh, so, so it's better to take a, a bit more points uh, and, and then have um, this causality relation. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously you can do quantum mechanics as well, but then, like you don't actually have uh, all these interesting structures, but just take a few points, uh, give them some partial order, and, and then you have enough to, to actually set up this machinery. Well, I guess quantum mechanics is that M is one dimensional, and then you still have a lot of problems. Uh, you, you, no, 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 I, I doesn't say you don't have problems, but the, the question is just with this um, retarded uh, and advanced green functions, that they mm. would then be, uh, just supported at one point. So uh, th there is no notion of, of, you know, being past or future supported because everything is a point uh, in, in so the, the, the uh, spatial slice is a point, right? So, so then, uh, yeah, uh, the, 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 not, not much is happening there. Um, Yeah, but, but you can also do that exercise. Uh, and, and just, it's, it's, it's um, well, yeah, when I finish and talk also about time order products, so uh, sort of like the, the whole story, it's, it's, it's useful to do the whole story uh, at a point, uh, just, just, to, uh, just to see what happens. Um, okay, so Poisson bracket, uh, Poisson bracket. Uh, and this construction is due to, due to piles. So this is called also piles bracket. Um, and I'm, I'm using a slightly exotic notation because uh, I, I want to reserve the nice uh, curly bracket notation for something else. Um, so I'm using this notation for the Poisson bracket. So I take my, uh, let's say at the point, Phi, this is defined as taking my Poisson by vector and contracting it with df at phi, answer dg at phi. So, so that, that you have seen uh, before. Um, and this essentially, uh, so this is f and g are multi-local functionals. This is well-defined. That's not obvious, but it's true. Um, I guess I can say it quickly why it's <laughs> well-defined. So the first derivative uh, of a multi-local functional um, is um, smooth. So as a distribution, doesn't have singularities. It's, it's just a smooth section. Uh, so that's why uh, this is well-defined. Um, that essentially, uh, already gives us the classical uh, model. So the next thing is that we want to extend this to our um, well, co-chain complex. This we can do. So we can also replace F and G with uh, multi-vector fields. So observation 
So these extends to uh, the whole differential graded algebra. The only problem with this is that uh, the space of multi-local things is not closed under that bracket. And this is true also uh, for these functions. This is because um, of the singularities of uh, that integral kernel. So the world is not ideal, uh, but um, the resulting space, well, yeah, but let's say uh, the space of multi-local, multi-local functionals is not closed under this bracket. So one typically uh, requires some completion. Um, and, and this is where more functional analysis comes in. So I'm just going to state it and, and then leave it out there. So it requires completion. So one uses uh, a space which is called uh, microcausal functionals. And uh, I will leave it out there. So for example, for example, use microcausal functionals. vector fields. So I'm, I'm going to give you also some references for that. So this requires, uh, so, so this enlarges the space of functionals, <clears throat> but you need some um, conditions on uh, the functional derivatives of that, so that their singularity structure matches the singularity structure of um, this um, this integral kernel that we are looking at. So, um, yeah, if there is time left, and I don't think there is going to be time left, but in case there is time left, I, I can say something more about it at, at the end of, of the lecture series. So, um, yeah. So conditions. on singularity sorry about the noise this is 11 uh yeah okay back online um okay <clears throat> sorry uh so that the notation for that would be microcausal. Okay, so just to summarize then with this caveat, uh, I obtain, um, so the one way to obtain a classical, classical, the G model is then to take, so to the region O, um, assign the space of microcausal polyvector fields. The bracket is this bracket and the differential is delta. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, a simpler model with less functional analysis uh, so also possible, we can take just the regular functionals. So these are the ones with smooth derivatives. And <clears throat> sorry, I need to drink more coffee. So this is also well-defined, but more boring. So this contains local observables, 
um, local nonlinear observables. And this is well defined, but boring. So only contains linear local observables and their products. Okay, so the second one you can understand based on what they actually lectured. For the first one, you need a bit of an excursion into a singularity structure of distributions and a bit more functional analysis. Uh, so yeah, for, for, for the sake of this lecture, you can focus on, on this one because this is actually understandable within uh, the framework I'm presenting. Okay, uh, so that is almost it, uh, but there is some more structure that's hiding uh, in the space of multi-vector fields that I haven't used yet, uh, but I will. So let's uh, do that next. Oh, maybe I should first ask, are there any questions to what we have up to now? Okay, so, so now this is uh, a slightly uh, different topic, it's a bit of a change of pace. Uh, so we are going to look a bit more into the graded geometry of the space of multi-vector fields. So um, it's going to bring us more structures that are going to be useful. So this is a more graded geometry. So first of all, observation. This space of polyvector fields or multivector fields, this in itself can be understood as the space of sections or space of functions on a shifted cotangent bundle of our uh, base configuration space. So this is shifted cotangent bundle. So, so the space of multi-vector fields can be seen as functions uh, on a graded manifold. This is a useful perspective because then um, when you go to the space of multi-vector fields, you're still working with functions of some given regularity uh, type. So regular, micro, causal, local, whatever, uh, but they are just living on a graded manifold instead of uh, just the usual uh, honest to goodness. Um, well, usual infinite dimensional manifold. So, so it's, it's kind of uh, maybe taking one more step into the dangerous zone. So uh, if you accept it that we are working with infinite dimensional manifolds, then hey, now we are working with infinite dimensional graded manifolds, which is uh, even even more uh, dangerous area. Uh, but fortunately, I, at least in this context, everything is kind of very explicitly given. So uh, there is there, there has been a lot uh, of work done to to build that framework. So uh, at least if you don't go too far away from things that are well explored, then uh, you should be safe. Um, but another good thing about uh, the space of multi-vector fields, uh, and this is uh, now more of a standard geometry statement, is that it has a lovely uh, bracket, namely uh, the Skouten bracket. So that's another observation. So we now have uh, 
a graded Poisson bracket. So delta V as the space of multi-vector fields comes with the Skouten bracket. Oh, sorry. Uh, just a second. I have to uh, restart my uh, computer. Well, not my computer, but my program. So let's see. Uh, Oh dear. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. This is this is when uh, my computer decides that I've been talking for too long, uh, which is probably true. But I, I still have five minutes, so uh, comes with. the Skouten bracket. So that they definitely want to say. So, uh, and this is where I reserve this, this nice curly bracket notation. Uh, so now I'm probably messing it up with the signs because I always do. Um, so I'm trying very hard to stick to a consistent sign convention, uh, but if, if I fail, then please excuse me. I'd, Despite working in graded geometry, I never figured out uh, the signs. So up to signs, uh, the bracket of a vector field and the function is, well, this um, directional derivative along the vector field applied to the function. So this is for f a function and x the vector field. For two vector fields, x and y, this is just a commutator, x and y, and I think the minus is in place. So x, y are vector fields, and then graded Leibniz rule. So what, what one obtains here is uh, not a usual uh, Poisson bracket, but it's a minus one shifted Poisson bracket. So the usual identities for the Poisson bracket have some signs uh, lurking in there. Um, and and this, this is... Uh, one of the main structures in the BV formalism, that, that bracket, uh, which we know as the Skouten bracket from uh, geometry. And in physics literature, this bracket is called anti-bracket. So also known as anti-bracket. Um, and to finish, uh, I just want to introduce some notation. So uh, th this is a bit of a physics notation. So uh, I want to make a bit more contact with the literature. So yeah, so we, oops, we have the anti-bracket here. Oh dear. And let me introduce some notation. So for a vector field, field X, I want to write it somewhat like uh, we write um, vector fields in um, finite dimensional setting. So, so you know, you have D, uh, G mu or uh, DXI as, as your 
um, basis vector, and then you can write a vector field in, in that basis. So I will use the notation x as some coefficient and d over d phi x. So this is in analogy to the finite dimensional case. And then dx on f is just written as this integral. So this, this makes uh, a sense because, uh, well, we are uh, working with uh, spaces of sections and spaces of functionals on these spaces of sections. So um, the way um, all these operations act can be written in terms of uh, integrals of, of some functions or integral kernels. So, so th this is a uh, well-justified notation, but also um, kind of useful uh, for computational purposes. And this derivative, I want to uh, identify with a formal generator uh, phi uh, double dagger, which carries the name of an anti-field in physics literature. So with that bit of notation, I can now write, so the general formula for the bracket can be written as follows. So we have, so here we will have just the pairing and here we take the right derivative of x with respect to phi. Well, in this case, phi is just um, an ordinary field. So um, there is no reason to distinguish between left and right derivatives, but there is a reason for uh, the other one. So this is the left derivative with respect to this formal generator that uh, describes um, this odd degree on the fiber minus dr x over d i star dl y over d phi. So let me just uh, comment here. So this is the right derivative. And this is left derivative. Okay, um, and this is probably uh, all I can say for today. So just to summarize this new bit of information on top of uh, the, the, the usual uh, honest uh, Poisson bracket that I constructed using the pairs method. Now I introduced into the game uh, a graded Poisson bracket, which is something particular to this BV formalism. And we are uh, encountering it because we are working um, with the space of multi-vector fields uh, to, to build our uh, differential graded algebra. So this is something which naturally uh, lives on this space and will be useful. So uh, maybe it's not so clear why it's useful yet, but it will be useful for quantization. Uh, okay, I should stop here because that's enough information. And tomorrow um, I will uh, say a few more things what you do in case of symmetries, and then I will uh, perform the quantization of the free theory. And I hope that by that time, Stefan is going to explain everything about infinite dimensional subtleties of, um, building the star product. So then I will have less work to do. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, are there any questions? Well, hi. So just um, the first question is just to check if I understand the, 
the notation of the passion bracket, the mm -hmm. bracket. I think that your sign convention is the opposite, no? Yeah, so, so this is the opposite sign convention to the usual um, scouting bracket, but I want to make it consistent with the sign convention used for um, this, this uh, ante bracket in, in BV formalism. So, um, yeah. If I plug in your last formula a vector field and a function, then a plus delta x applied to f, not minus. Is that right? Uh, let's see. So this x, f. Because first, but so be. Um, oh, yeah, actually, yes, yeah, sorry. I, I knew that I would screw up the notation, uh, of course. So. Just to check on that I understood the notation. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. So, so I, if I understand you correctly, uh, that is this without minus sign, right? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah. Sorry about that. I, I just cannot retain signs in 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 my head. So, uh, yeah. but this is <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. The second question that I have is, uh, which is the relation between the pyre bracket and the anti bracket? Oh, oh, this is a very good question. Yes. Uh, so is it, you see that the one is shifted and the other is not. Um, so there is, uh, yeah. So, so maybe, so th this, um, yeah. So, so, so this anti bracket exists always, uh, independent of, you know, what types of equations you're dealing with. So, so this is something which you always have from the geometry of the problem. Um, using this uh, bracket and uh, one more property. So let's see, how can I say it best? Um, so, so yeah, so I talked about the time slice axiom, right? At the beginning. Um, and uh, if my theory has the time slice axiom, uh, my classical theory has the time slice axiom on the cohomology level, uh, then this uh, anti-bracket together with this time slice axiom actually induce a, a, the, the bracket, which is um, equivalent to the pious bracket on the cohomology level. So, so the, the, the precise relation I would say is that uh, the pious bracket is uh, what, what, what's sort of uh, remains from the anti-bracket uh, on the cohomology level if you are using uh, additionally the, the time slice axiom. So there is, um, I mean, maybe I can go through that calculation uh, as well. Uh, so, so this is discussed uh, at the end of my paper with William. Um, we discuss exactly this uh, relation between uh, pious bracket and, uh, and the anti-bracket. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question. I, I'm not so familiar with the BV formulism for Lagrangian. Yes. Rather for Hamiltonian. Ah. So uh, there should be similarities. So I, I wonder in Hamiltonian theory, you have this famous ghosts for ghosts. So if you're in a singular situation and then yes. some, some, some double complex, etc., are you avoiding this here by, by your first assumption uh, where you were talking about uh, the work of Mark Eno? Yeah, so, so here I didn't even talk about ghosts yet. So this was all for uh, the scalar field in this situation where uh, h minus one is zero. So, so my BV complex is, is, is just this part. So, so that's all of my BV complex for now. So this is the situation without symmetries. So you don't need a resolution of something. Well, this is already a resolution, you see? So um, yeah, so H minus one is zero and you can actually also show that uh, higher uh, cohomologies uh, vanish. So, so this already becomes a resolution. 
Now, uh, if I had symmetry, so if I had something non-trivial in H minus one, then uh, I would have to uh, kill it by uh, introducing new generators in degree two. So, so, so this is where the ghosts come in. And, and then if that's not enough to have a resolution, then I would have to introduce things in higher degrees. And that's where ghosts of ghosts come in. Okay. Uh, so so I'm, I'm just going to uh, make a, a, a sort of blanket statement about it uh, by saying, well, we can extend this to some graded manifold such that this becomes a resolution. So I'm, I'm not going to, to discuss the, the, the art of doing so, um, but yeah, there's typically, yeah. In physics, one, one wants a resolution. So um, what, we, would, we would also need ghosts of ghosts. Um, in, in mathematics, well, not necessarily. I mean, you just have the complex, you compute the cohomology, right? I mean, you, you, don't, you don't necessarily need this to be a resolution. But I, I would talk about a bit more about symmetries uh, tomorrow. Uh, hopefully I will come to the quantization. This is always, you know, one thinks how much can be said in five hours of lectures. That's not much. Right. Okay. Um, uh, no more questions then. Uh, thank you again. Thank you.